for where two or three have gathered together in my name i am there in the midst matthew 18 20 yeah this morning we want to request brother zack to share god's word with us We read in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4, uh, we've looked at this verse before, 2 Corinthians 4, we have seen it before, verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now that verse teaches us. You see, by the way, this chapter goes back to the beginning of creation. In chapter 4, verse 6, it says in, in the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And he compares that to our being born again, when light is, comes into our heart. And in verse 16, he's talking again about in the initial creation where every day something happened. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, till it was perfect. So he says, in the same way, in our life, our inner man, just like in Genesis 1, must progress more and more and more and more every day. That means our growth must be continuous. There must never be any backsliding in our life. That's God's perfect will for us. So as I've observed <clears throat> a lot of Christians, even in CFC through the years, in many, many churches that I've had the opportunity now to observe hundreds and hundreds of believers in our own churches fairly closely over a period of 40 years, I have been greatly saddened and grieved to see this lack of growth. <clears throat> There are good brothers, but they remain good brothers without any spiritual progress and discernment and without greater godliness. It's like a a kid who's getting 100% every year, but he's in the first standard every year. What's he who's getting 100% every year if you remain in the first standard or first grade? So there must be progress and we must not be satisfied in our life if that is not happening. Uh, think of God as a father. How would you feel as a father if your child is not growing taller, when it's one year, two years, the same size, or when it's three, four years old and it can't even speak, can't even say a few words, and it grows up, grows up, and when it's 10 years old, it can't add two plus two, you'd really be grieved. And I really believe God is grieved when he does not see his children progressing. Every parent would be grieved if their child fails in one class and loses one year in school, not two years, one year, you're grieved. You expect your child to go to the next class in one year. And I want to say to you in Jesus' name, to everyone sitting here, now if you're not born again, that means you've not surrendered to Christ, Christ has not become Lord of your life, then you're not even in school. <clears throat> Then you're like these children of laborers and all who play in the mud and the sand the whole day. They're 20 years old, they learn nothing. You're like that. But if you're born again, you've really surrendered your life to Christ, you have entered school. And then there should be a progress in your life every single year. If not every single day, which is a very high standard. Paul writes this testimony. He had come to such a level where there was progress in his life every day. We can get there if we are wholehearted, maybe after 40, 50 years, but uh, at least in the beginning there should be progress every year. So it's good for us to examine ourselves at least once a year 
you know, God has made the earth to go around the sun in 365 and a quarter days. So by the time it comes back to the same place, it's good to check up if we made some progress in that one period, that one cycle. And as I've tried to <clears throat> understand what the reason for this is, one is, <clears throat> like I've often said, there is a lack of assurance in the hearts of many, many of God's people that God has really accepted them. They're always struggling to be accepted. You know, even children want to be accepted. Children feel very in inferior if the others in school don't accept them. And I believe our security must come in knowing that God has accepted us. That's the first step. You must be absolutely sure that God has accepted you. If you're not sure of that, don't wait for somebody in CFC to tell you that. You know, I never tell people, you're a child of God. God has accepted you. I mean, I may say it from the pulpit, but I don't go to an individual and say that because I don't know. It's hard. The Bible says in Romans 8 and verse if you don't know this verse, please see it, Romans 8 and verse 16. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I want to say to all of you, I plead with you, my beloved brothers and sisters, don't rest until the Holy Spirit has given you a witness in your spirit that you are a child of God. Every elder in CFC putting you on the CFC commitment list and calling you a child of God will not save you. You can still go to hell. I believe there are many people who sit in commitment lists of CFC who are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven because they are satisfied with man's acceptance. Don't ever be satisfied with that. That is only for earthly purposes. You must be absolutely sure yourself that the Holy Spirit has borne witness in your spirit that you're a child of God. In the Old Testament, it was not like this. If you were born into the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you were circumcised on the eighth day, you're an Israelite. It was an external thing. You didn't have to worry about anything. But in the New Covenant, it is an inner birth which I don't know whether it's taken place. Over a period of years, I may be able to see it. But in the beginning, I don't know. That's why we, we wait sometime even to baptize people. And even baptism, <clears throat> we may baptize the wrong people. I'm sure I've baptized some people, sincerely, but who are going to hell. Yeah, I, I know it. Because... They backslid after they were born again or they were never, never really saved. They fooled me. Do you know in Acts chapter 8 there was a magician who fooled even Philip? The anointed deacon Philip was fooled and he baptized a person and then Peter and John came and said, Hey, you're not even, you're not even converted. So mistaken baptisms have taken, even in, uh, taken place even in the Acts of the Apostles. We can't guarantee that everyone who's baptized is a child of God. That's why I say to your parents, don't be satisfied that your child is baptized. Now, heaven is guaranteed. Not necessarily. I hope they're following the Lord. Hebrews 3 and verse 14 says, If we hold fast to the beginning of our confidence, firm until the end, then we are made partakers of Christ. But the Holy Spirit will bear witness to you. So seek for the that witness of the Holy Spirit in your spirit, where the Spirit of God says, you're a child of God. God is your Father. And it's the Holy Spirit in verse 15, <clears throat> when it comes in, cries out, Abba, Father. There's a sense that the whole, you feel the Holy Spirit says, God in heaven is my own dad. Do you have that assurance? If there's anybody sitting here without that assurance, I want, to, I want you to seek God earnestly. From today, seek him earnestly because we don't want you to be lost. We want you to be absolutely sure 
every single one of you that the spirit of god gives you a witness you're a child of god and cries out dad that is the number one step and to always be there to always remember that your father in heaven cares for you cares for the hair on your head he cares for you more than the sparrows in the world and calls you the apple of his eye to find that security that he rejoices over you this is very 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 important and this is one of the main reasons many people do not grow they lose that assurance so they give it up they don't live every day in that assurance every day you must wake up with that assurance god in heaven is my father and he's planned my day today and i don't know what's going to happen but he's my dad and he's undertaken for everything i go go forth today with the assurance that my heavenly father has already provided for everything needed for me in my life so that's a wonderful way to begin and to live our life and to find our security there and i believe that if i find my security in that you'll find that you're also you don't end up in competition and with other believers and you don't find yourself jealous that somebody has more than you if your heavenly father has decided to give more to somebody you say well praise the lord it's my dad in heaven who decided he must have more than me or that he should be better looking than me or uh, that she should be more intelligent than me that's my heavenly father well praise god if my dad in heaven decided that i'm happy you'll never 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 i'll tell you honestly from my experience you'll never be jealous of anybody you'll never be in competition with anybody you will never even compare yourself with anybody on the face of the earth once you know god is your heavenly dad it is the secret of constant spiritual development but that assurance of acceptance alone is not enough <clears throat> from there which we must always have till the end of our life there's another very important truth that the bible says you know we we're told that it's only as we see jesus more clearly that we can be like him second corinthians 3 verse 18 says the holy spirit shows us the glory of jesus in his word the mirror is the word then we he changes us into that likeness i cannot be like him unless i see him clearly and even though um, the story of jesus is in the four gospels so many christians have read the four gospels even if they haven't read the rest of the new testament i think most believers have read the four gospels but you can read the four gospels and not see jesus you can see the historical jesus which the world also knows about there was a man called jesus who did miracles was crucified rose again okay that's just story but to see jesus spiritually that's very very important that's what will challenge us to be like him so how can that take place so i want to show you a passage in john chapter 12 in john chapter 12 this is the answer that jesus himself gave <clears throat> how people can see him see john 12 and verse 20 you know the jews had virtually rejected jesus they hated him the pharisees they wanted to kill him but there were people from another country greece we read in verse 20 there were certain greeks who were probably proselyte jews who came up to worship at the feast they were converted in greece and became jews and they came to philip verse 21 and said we want to see jesus isn't that your desire we want to see jesus so philip came and along with andrew and told jesus there are some people from greece who want to see you now most preachers would be very excited if some foreigner wants to see them but not jesus he was not bothered by that you can come from any part of the world and he told them how they could see him and that's what we need to learn he says unless verse 24 a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies it remains by itself alone now this is the answer to we want to see jesus 
But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. He who loves his life in this earth will lose it. But he who hates his life in this earth will keep it to life eternal. So if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there will my servant also be. If any man serves me, the Father will honor him. So this is the way to see Jesus. Jesus had a way of giving abstract answers to a very straightforward question. What he was saying is, the important thing is not to see my physical face. To see my physical face, everybody sees it. Even the Pharisees see it and so many people see it. But to really see me, you must be willing to fall into the ground and die like a grain of wheat. That means you must be willing to lose that earthly attractiveness that you have and this life that you have in this earth. Like the, you know, a grain of wheat has got an outer shell and when it goes into the ground, it cracks open. And when it cracks open, the life inside that grain comes up through the earth and produces a hundred grains of wheat. That is the principle of all farming. One grain of wheat falls into the ground and it cracks open and the life inside comes out. Now, if you don't let it go into the ground and fall into the ground and die, you take that grain of wheat and it's a beautiful grain of wheat and put it in a glass case in a cupboard. It will be a grain of wheat even after a hundred years. But if you allow it to fall into the ground and die, in a hundred years it will be a million grains of wheat. This is the secret of fruitfulness. This is the secret of seeing Jesus. In other words, there must be a, a brokenness. That a brokenness, you know, a grain of wheat which wants to appear beautiful before others. It will never be willing to be broken or to die. Because it's concerned about its testimony. Many Christians are more concerned about their testimony before others. Everybody must think I'm a spiritual man. More than their desire to see Jesus. I want to ask you honestly. What is your greatest desire? Is it that everybody in the church would think you're a very spiritual person? Or is it your passion to see Jesus? I couldn't care less whether people think I'm spiritual or not. It doesn't bother. I'm, I'm not interested in getting a reputation in the church. I want to see Jesus. There are very few people like that, I tell you. In all our CFC churches, even in people who have been in the CFC churches for many years, they have a desire to have a good testimony. They are disturbed when they feel something has happened which will spoil my testimony. Uh-huh. That's what you're concerned about. The Lord sees that. He says, that's what you're concerned. Okay, pursue that. But there are others who say, Lord, what people think about me is not important. Because what you think about me, that's the only thing that's important. I want to see you more clearly because that's the only way I'll become like you. And the only way to see you is for me to lose my outward attractiveness and to be broken and misunderstood and reproached and I rejoice in it. Jesus said, when you're reproached and misunderstood, rejoice. I tell you, in my entire life, I may have seen two or three Christians like that. Most of them are so offended when people misunderstood me. Oh, ho. They misunderstood me. I must do everything to justify myself. When will they ever want to be broken to see Jesus? Brokenness is a wonderful thing. Throughout scripture you find that, you, you remember in the previous chapter, I'm sorry, not the previous chapter, same chapter before he speaks about the grain of wheat falling into ground and dying. You see a picture of that in earlier on. In, it says in the house of... Bethany, chapter 12, verse 3, Mary was so grateful that her brother Lazarus had been raised from the dead that she took a pound of very costly perfume. And that was in some type of bottle or jar, whatever they had those days. And she had to break it in order to let that fragrance of the ointment come forth. Otherwise, it won't come forth. There's always brokenness. Before, and then it says when she did it, verse 3, the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. 
Now you see another example of that earlier on in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, Now that's not very clearly written here. Maybe we should see the other story, same story of the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew 14. In Matthew 14, we read here, the feeding of the 5,000, which we see in John 6, is written in more detail in Matthew 14. Remember, all the miracles that Jesus did, he was teaching his disciples something. First of all, he was teaching that there's no problem that God cannot solve. That is the fundamental message in all the miracles. Every miracle, there was one message. No problem that God cannot solve. He taught his disciples that for three and a half years. And if we have learned that, that solves a big problem in our life, that there's no problem God cannot solve. So here was a problem with 5,000 people, there's not enough food. One boy had five loaves and two fish and Jesus said in verse 18, Matthew 14, 18, Bring them here to me. And he ordered the multitudes to recline on the grass. And now see what he did. He took the five loaves and two fish. And there were two things that he did. He blessed it, verse 19, and then he broke it and then fed the multitude. Now what I want you to see is, when he blessed the five loaves, it was still five loaves. But when he broke it, it became 50,000 loaves to feed all those 10,000 people, 5,000 men, plus a lot of women and children. So how did the five loaves become 50,000? Not just by being blessed, but by being broken. There's a message there which the disciples probably didn't understand then, but they understood later. Very often, we are so eager to pray, Lord, bless me. Bless me. It's one of the most common prayers that all believers pray. You're blessed and you remain the same. We also need to pray, Lord, now that you've blessed me, break me. Then five will become 50,000. This is the secret. Whether you see it in the grain of wheat falling into the ground and dying and coming forth so that we can see Jesus more clearly, or whether it's in the alabaster vial of perfume that's broken so that the odor fills the whole house, or in the feeding of a multitude it's always brokenness, brokenness, brokenness. We read in the Old Testament of examples like this, you know, the great man Moses. He was mighty in word and deed, we read at the age of 40, but he was not fit to lead God's people. You can be mighty in scripture, mighty in preaching, and you're unfit to lead God's people. God needed to take Moses into the wilderness for 40 years and break him. How did he break him? He made him live in his father-in-law's house for 40 years. You try living in your father-in-law's house for one year and see what will happen. You marry somebody and live with her father and work for her father. Any of you experience that? I don't know. One year would be enough. Imagine 40 years and a guy who was the ruler in Egypt going to be the next pharaoh. Boy, God really knows how to humble people. He humbled him so much that at the end of 40 years, he was such a broken man, Moses, that when God said, Moses, I want you to lead my people, he said, Lord, not me. Please send somebody else. I'm not fit. This man who at the age of 40 was such an eloquent speaker, such a powerful man, with one hit, he could kill an Egyptian. Imagine killing an Egyptian with one blow in his hand. He was really strong. But he wasn't broken. I mean, if he had tried to deliver the Israelites like that, killing one Egyptian at a time, <laughs> where would he have finished? God said, that's not my way. He broke him 
and as a broken man, he stood at the Red Sea and lifted up his rod, old 80-year-old man, and he didn't kill one Egyptian. He killed the entire Egyptian army under the Red Sea. They were all buried there. And God was saying, do you know what I can do through a broken man? What could you do, Moses, when you were strong in yourself? You killed one person? See now what I did. I delivered all of you. That is a great lesson in the Old Testament. When God gives a man leadership, he has to first take him through an education of brokenness. And I really believe that is the reason why we don't have many godly, humble leaders today whom God can anoint and back up. India needs a lot more like that. The world needs a lot more like that. Many who are blessed, tremendously blessed. They've got such abilities and such, they can sing well, they can preach well, they know the Bible so well. What's missing? Brokenness. The grain of wheat is still a beautiful grain of wheat. It's on display in the pulpits in a glass case. Not much fruit. Not much fruit in their life. Even after years and years, they still lose their temper. They still get into bad moods and no self-control. What's the reason? They've never allowed God to break them. They always want to appear good and great and spiritual before the eyes of man. You really want to be spiritual, my dear brothers and sisters. Let me give you a little bit of advice. Stop trying to appear spiritual before people. It's a battle. It's very, very difficult. But if you stop trying to appear spiritual before people, and when you lose your reputation, rejoice. Jesus said, leap for joy when people speak evil about you. How many times have you leapt for joy when you were misunderstood and people spoke evil of you? No, you want to justify yourself and say, no, 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 it was not like that. It was this. And another opportunity to be broken, missed. And God gives you hundreds of opportunities to be broken and you miss all of them and you wonder at the end of so many years why it's not better with you than it should be. Why there's not a greater anointing in your life? Why rivers are not flowing out of your life? Why scripture is not opening up to you in Revelation? I'll tell you the answer. Live before the face of God. Alone. And if God breaks you through your father-in-law or mother-in-law or anybody, just let him break you and humble you and make you small in your own eyes. You know, when King Saul fell away, what uh, Samuel told him, it's very interesting, if you turn to 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel and I think it's chapter 13, It's either in chapter 13 or chapter 15, I'm not very sure where. You know, the Lord told him to go and kill all the Amalekite sheep. But before that, once when he acted as a, in 1 Samuel 13, he acted as a priest. We read that in verse 12. Samuel, he said to Samuel, I saw the Philistines coming and I forced myself to offer an offering. And he had no right to offer an offering. He was not a priest. And Samuel said, you have acted foolishly. Now the Lord would have established you as king forever. But now he's taken away the kingdom from you. And he's appointed a man after his own heart. In chapter 15, it happened a second time. When the Lord told him, go and kill all the Amalekites. And he didn't kill all the Amalekites. He said, I've taken some of the best of the Amalekites. And I give them to you. And the Lord, Samuel told him in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Does the Lord have delight in sacrifices or in obedience? To obey is better than sacrifice. And uh, somewhere there he says, When you were small in your own eyes. Chapter 13? 15, 17, yeah. Okay, thank you. 15, 17, yeah. When you were little in your own eyes. I'm getting old. I miss the verses. <laughs> when you were little in your own eyes, God 
made you the head, anointed you king. I want to ask all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, please examine yourself carefully. Was there a time when you were little in your own eyes? Not so today, right? Now you're a big person. You're an important person. You're a respected person. You're appreciated. You become prominent. No wonder your spiritual life has gone down. It's a very blessed thing to remain little in our own eyes. That's how Saul lost his kingdom. And that's how many people lose the anointing. And that's how many people, that's the reason why many people don't progress. It's because they are not broken. To be little in our own eyes is to become small. We're really small. We possess the kingdom of God. Otherwise all you'll get a, is a kingdom in the church or the kingdom on earth where people respect you. I'm not interested in a kingdom in the church or on the earth. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, if you want to possess the kingdom of God, uh, you must be able to go through the eye of a needle. A camel gone go through the eye of a needle. You heard me sa say how an amoeba, which is the smallest of all beings. Amoeba is so small, you've got to see it. And I don't know whether you can even see it under a microscope. But it's so small that the eye of a needle is as big as that door. It can just run in and out of the eye of a needle. Why? Because it's small. Whereas we find it so difficult even to put a thread through an eye of a needle. An amoeba is so small, it's no problem. I can run in and out of it without touching the edges of that eye of the needle. Smallness, that's what, and Jesus said, that's how you enter God's kingdom. You cannot enter the God's kingdom, he said, unless you can go through the eye of a needle. So to be little in our own eyes is a wonderful thing. And when you're little in your own eyes, I'll tell you one mark of it, you don't get offended. Do you ever get offended with people? What somebody said to you, or somebody didn't give you the respect you felt you deserved, or somebody said something about you that was false, and you rise to justify yourself, you're offended. I, I have often said that's one of the first things we have to learn to overcome, get, getting offended. It's a kindergarten lesson that means Whatever people do to me or say to me, I refuse to get offended. And whether you get offended is not, is not something seen in the outside, in your heart. There are many people who are good at yoga and keep their mouth shut. And you think they are not offended. Boy, they are offended. Look inside their heart. They go back home and meditate on what somebody said. Or the respect somebody didn't give them. Are you like that? You got honor before men. You got honor before men because you kept your mouth shut. Now what is it? You value that? When you see that in your heart you were offended and hurt with somebody because of what he told you or what he didn't say to you, you can be offended with your own husband or wife. Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended in me. It's one of the marks of not being broken. You know, these are tests by which we can find out, Lord, I thought I was a broken person, but I discover in this situation I'm not. Praise the Lord that you discovered it. I mean, if you went for a routine annual medical checkup and you discovered you had cancer, oh boy, shouldn't you be thankful that you discovered that? You didn't go for a checkup on cancer, you go for your annual medical checkup and you discover something seriously wrong with you. That's the way you should feel when in normal life something happened and you got offended, say, wow, thank you Lord for that revelation that I'm not small in my own eyes, that I think pretty highly of myself, that though I controlled my mouth and tongue like a good practitioner of yoga, I, my heart was still hurt and I'm thinking about it for the whole day after that. 
you, if you're offended, it won't bother you what people said or did. You won't be thinking about it the whole day. You won't be lying awake at night and thinking about what people said. I'm telling you honestly. Seek with all your heart, my dear brothers and sisters, from the earliest time of your Christian life to finish with getting offended. Not just to get up and boast, oh, I don't get offended. That's to get honor. Make sure you're not offended in your heart. Make sure that in different circumstances in your life, you just don't get offended. It's one, it's one proof of being broken. It's broken, I mean the grain of wheat that's gone underground and all types of people are walking on top of the ground. It's not bothered. Say, God's allowed me to go down and say, a brokenness is going to take place, fruit will come out. This is very, very important. This is what God has to do with all his people. God had to do it with uh, the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints. And sometimes, I want to tell you this, it's God's last resort. He allows us to sin, to break us. That's not his best way. God hates sin. For example, when he broke Moses, he did not make him sin. He just humbled him with his father-in-law and even Jacob who was a pretty tough stubborn man, God broke him by putting him 20 years with his father-in-law. It seems to be a standard method in the Old Testament, put them with their father-in-law and make them work for their father-in-law and live there and they come out broken. And God can do that even today, sure. You know, make you so financially helpless that you've got to keep going to your father-in-law for money. There you are. And uh, God breaks you. But God did not break Jacob through sin. It was through that humiliation of having to work for his father-in-law for 20 years. And God broke him and said, now you're Israel from now on. You read that in Genesis 32. It's the same message right through. But in the New Testament we see another example of Peter. Who was such a proud man. When God called him. When Jesus called him at the lakeside of Galilee. He was just an ordinary fisherman. Nobody knew of him. Peter, Simon, he was known as Simon those days. Simon, we don't know. There are so many people with that name. And God had a plan for him. And he picked him up. And Jesus did miracles through him. We read that Jesus sent out his disciples to heal the sick. And Peter went out healing the sick. And he really began to think that he was very important. He was one of the inner three circle of Jesus. He's like the elders among the twelve disciples and he really began to have high thoughts about himself to the point where he said, Lord, if everybody denies you, I won't deny you. Now, how does God break such a proud man? Because God's got a plan for him and I tell you this, God loves you so much that he's got a plan for your life and if there's no other way to break you, he will even allow you to fall into sin. If that's the only way he can break you. That's his last resort. He can give you a difficult father-in-law, mother-in-law, difficult wife, difficult children. None of these things break you. Then finally he says, okay, with this guy, I love him so much. I want to fulfill my purpose through him. I have to allow him to fall. Can you imagine how God hates that? God hates sin. And to allow one of his children to fall into sin in order to make him what he wants to be that shows how much God is interested in breaking us. And that is why we read in the life of Peter that even though Jesus prayed for Peter, if you're not familiar with that passage, please turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. Luke 22, where you know the story where the Lord said, Simon, you're going to deny me three times. Before tomorrow morning, You'll deny me three times. Luke 22 verse 34. And just in case you don't know, denying Jesus is a very serious sin. Because Jesus said, I think it's in Matthew 10, If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. He said that. He didn't say if you commit adultery I'll deny you. No. He said, if you deny me, I'll deny you. So which is more serious? We think Peter denying Jesus was a small thing. No. 
it was the one sin that Jesus said would make him deny you before the Father. That's how serious it was and he did it three times. Now if you had read that Jesus, uh, Peter went out and committed adultery three times that night, in one night, you say, wow, that guy was really a sinner. But we don't take it so seriously when we read that he went and denied Jesus three times. That's a very serious sin. And why did God allow him to do that? Why didn't God protect him? I've often thought about that, you know. It says Peter went to the gate of the high priest and he could not go in. Because the sentry at the gate said, who in the world are you? Get out from here. John, who was inside and who knew the high priest, came to the gate and said to the sentry, okay, let him in. Why did God allow John to do that? <laughs> if Peter had not gone in, he would not have denied the Lord. It was John opening the door for Peter to go in that made Peter come inside and deny the Lord three times. God knew Peter going in is going to deny. Why not protect him from that? Don't let John know that Peter is at the gate and Peter has to go away. He doesn't deny the Lord. Simple. But he would not be broken. So no, no, no. John has to know that Peter is waiting at the gate. John has to go and speak to the sentry and Peter comes inside. See the sovereignty of God in all these things? Sometimes you wonder, God knew that I was going to commit the sin. Why didn't he stop me over there? No, he won't stop you. Because he wants you to sin. Because you're so proud. You're so big in your own eyes. He hates sin. But he sees there's no other way to break you. But there are some people, even after they sin, they don't get broken. Brokenness is so important in God's eyes that he even allows a person to fall into what he hates. In God's eyes, I'll tell you what sinning is like. Sinning is like falling into the sewage pit. With all the toilets being flushed down the street, you know, what's in that sewage pit. And you fall into that. God says, you've got to fall into that. That's how bad sin is. And God allows that to one of his children because he says, what comes out of it, if you're broken, something valuable has come out of it. That's why Jesus said, verse 32, Luke 22, 32. I am not praying that you will not fall. No. That I will not pray. But I will pray that after you fall, your faith will not fail. That when you fa failed and failed and failed and failed and hit rock bottom after denying me three times, there you will remember that I still love you, that your father still loves you and you can come back. Just like the prodigal son. So why did God have to do this with Peter? Because he had such a fantastic plan for Peter on the day of Pentecost. Which is just about 40 days after this. Just about six weeks. In six weeks, Peter has to become the great man of God on the day of Pentecost. Who's going to preach a 15 minute sermon. And 3000 people are going to get converted and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't think there's ever been a sermon like that in the history of Christianity where somebody gets up and preaches for 15 minutes and 3,000 people are saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit and 3,000 Jews it's difficult to convert one Jew 3,000 Jews getting converted and can you imagine if some one of the disciples went and slapped Peter on the back and said wow Peter what a great man of God you are he said hang on I know what I did six weeks ago uh, don't pat me on the back. I know what a total failure I was. Worse than the whole lot of you 11 disciples. It did not go to his head. All that he accomplished in his life never went to his head. Because God did such a thorough work in breaking him. And that day when he denied the Lord. If God hasn't done such a work in you, my brother, sister, you can live many, many years and do many great things for the Lord in the church. But you'll never accomplish what God wants to accomplish through you. Maybe because in some situation God saw when he corrected you or did something, you got offended. You got hurt. And God said, okay, I won't trouble you anymore. I remember once correcting a brother who used to be an elder in one of our churches, not with us now. 
and I corrected him in something, one of our CFC churches, and I said, brother, this is not the way to do things. And he turned around to me and said, he was 10, 15 years younger to me. He said, brother Zach, nobody talks to me like that. I said, oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'll never speak to you like that again. And I never did. I never corrected him for the rest of his life. I don't know where he is today. He left us long ago, but I could see his life went down. See, when we are not willing to receive correction, we get offended. Who's going to lose? You think the one who corrects us is going to lose? Not at all. We're going to lose. So, Peter was willing to let God break him and humble him whichever way he chose. And the result was not just the day of Pentecost, till the end of his life, he remained a broken man. And I'll give you one example of that. We read in the book of Galatians, many, many years after Pentecost, many years after Pentecost. This must be maybe 13 years at least after Pentecost, because Paul was converted 10 years after Pentecost, and then three years after Paul was converted, it says... In Galatians 1.18, three years later I went to Jerusalem and I became acquainted with Peter. It's the first time he's meeting Peter after three years. And then <clears throat> later on, after an interval of 14 years, chapter 2 verse 1, he went again to Jerusalem, chapter 2 verse 1, with Barnabas. And by the time Paul had accomplished a great ministry, planted churches and uh, understood the revelation of the gospel. And when he was in uh, Antioch, in verse 11, when Cephas came to Antioch a little later, Paul was there. I opposed him to his face. Can you imagine standing up to the leader, worldwide leader of the apostles, and you're 10 years younger than him? And you got converted 10 years after him. And standing up to his face and saying, Why are you, why did you stop eating with the Gentiles just when you saw some Christian leaders from Jerusalem coming? You didn't want them to see you eating with the Gentiles? You wanted to again, you moved your table and sat with the Jews? You moved your chair rather, you went and sat with the Jews? Because you wanted to give them the impression, no, I don't have any contact with the Gentiles. See, the Jews and Gentiles didn't get along too well those days. And Peter sought honor. And it says here, verse 12, prior to the coming of certain men from James, he ate with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and held himself, being afraid, being afraid of one group of Christians who were legalists. And even the other Jews who were converted were carried away in the hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was carried away in hypocrisy. Barnabas went along with Peter. But when I saw this, remember, this is a young Paul who was probably about 40 years old, talking to Peter who was 50. I saw that they were not straightforward. I said to Cephas in the presence of everybody, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and so on. And he goes on. If, and then, you know the worst part of it. Okay, he did that. Humiliated Peter in the presence of all these great Christian leaders. And then, he writes about it to the Galatians. Who are the Galatians? An immature bunch of Christians. Can you imagine writing about the great apostle Peter, his failure to an immature bunch of Christians. You see, according to our human understanding, we say, you should never do that, brother. Paul, are you sure you're inspired by the Holy Spirit writing to these immature Galatians about the failure of the great mighty apostle Peter? Why don't you keep that secret and hide it all? Do you know how many Christians are governed by the thinking of psychology and human wisdom? They don't know God. God's ways are different. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, God told Paul, write about Peter. Lord, these Galatians are immature. Never mind, write about them. Do you have that boldness? 
I think most Christians I've met don't know God like that. They think love covers a multitude of sins, just hide it all. But Paul was concerned about the gospel more than about an individual, even if it's Peter. And you see that in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 also. The Lord told John, the failures of the five of those elders, publish it to all the seven churches. There are very few people like John who would do it today. Because they lose their reputation. Why do you want to advertise the failures of those elders? You read Revelation, the first three chapters. Read it out. Can you picture this? The elder of the church of Laodicea sitting there with his wife and family. And John's messenger comes up in the pulpit and says, I've got a message from the Apostle John. And it is for the elder sitting here. You are wretched, miserable, poor. Can you imagine how his family is feeling now? And that's an, I'm not finished. Blind, naked. I'm going to spit you out of your mouth. And I can imagine some of the deacons in that church going up to him and saying, you shouldn't say all that in public. Why can't you just call him aside and tell him that privately? Human wisdom versus divine wisdom. I have met very, very few people in my life who have understood God's ways. It says in Psalm 103 verse 7, the people of Israel saw God's actions, but Moses understood God's ways because he lived in secret before the mouth the top of the mount with God. God's ways are not our ways. And that's why people try to build the church according to man's ways if they don't build it. They build a congregation. God's ways are different. Brokenness. Never get offended. <clears throat> Let God break you in any way he wants. And the wonderful thing I wanted to tell you about Peter was even though he heard <clears throat> humiliated in public and he also heard that Paul wrote about him to the immature Galatian Christians. I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter. See how Peter refers to Paul. This is the mark of the, the man Peter was little in his own eyes. 2 Peter 3 and verse 15. He says, regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. 2 Peter 3.15 Just as our beloved brother Paul Imagine he's quoting somebody 10 years younger than him. Have you ever quoted somebody 10 years younger than you? And somebody who criticized you publicly? According to the wisdom God gave him has written so many things in his letters which are hard to understand. Look at the humility of Peter. He says, they're tough. I can't really understand everything. But some people distort it. There I see, that is towards the end of Peter's life. You know, Peter says in Second Peter 1, uh, the Lord has shown me that I've got to lay aside my body now. Second Peter 1, 14. He says, I'm going to die very soon. What is his attitude just before his death? He is little in his own eyes. How did he become like that? Because God did such a thorough work in breaking him. And he responded to it. When God stripped the outer shell of that grain of wheat, he said, do it, Lord. Make me small in the eyes of others. If you will sincerely, listen to me, if you will sincerely allow God to do that to you, to humiliate you in public or in private or anywhere, and you say, okay, Lord, I accept it. And let God do a thorough work in you. Your life will be of fantastic usefulness to God till the end of your life, brother or sister. And if you young people can learn this from a very young age, Allow God to break you. You should be pleading. Lord, you blessed me. Now break me, break me, break me. Put me in my father-in-law's house for 40 years if you like. But break me. Do something. But I want to live a useful life for you on this earth. I don't want to drift along like so many believers. Easily offended. Another characteristic of people who are not broken is they always are quick to justify themselves. 
Jesus said about the Pharisees in Luke 16, 15, you are those who justify yourself before men. That verse has been written so strongly in my mind. You are those who justify yourselves before men. And I said, Lord, I never want to do that in my life. Let the whole world misunderstand me. I will not justify myself before men. It's okay. If somebody wants to believe something about me, they can go ahead and believe it. <laughs> Perfectly okay for me. Does it disturb you? Do you have such a lust to prove that you're not so bad as people think you are? That you're more spiritual than people have given you um, respect for? No, if you die a dead man, he's not interested what you think about him. The fact that you're concerned what people think about you proves that you're not dead yet, you're alive. You're not crucified with Christ. Yeah, this is the reason why, you know, so many people say, Lord, anoint me. I've seen so many people who are anointed with the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues. But the perfume inside the bottle, nobody can smell it. Because it's not broken. The light doesn't shine out. We read in the Old Testament, you read a beautiful story in Judges chapter 7 of Gideon, his army of 300. He told them, carry an earthen jar with you. And inside the earthen jar, put a light. Nobody will be able to see it. But just as you go into battle, break that jar. And the light will shine out. Paul takes that example and he says in 2 Corinthians 4, I don't have time to show it to you, read it. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel, but nobody can see it. But God allows us to go through so many persecutions and humiliations and we bear the dying of Jesus in this earthen vessel and the vessel is broken and the light shines out. It's the same message everywhere in scripture if you look for it. It's through brokenness that the perfume is spread. It's through brokenness that the light is spread. So don't justify yourself. Don't get offended. Don't try to prove how spiritual you are. I'll tell you one more thing. Be quick to apologize. Is the advice I give to married couples. And I give to all people. Be quick to admit your error. Say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. It was my mistake. It's very difficult to hear those words come out of the mouths of believers. I'll tell you. Young believers, older believers... To hear these words, you're right, I'm sorry, that was my mistake, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. When was the last time you said words like that to anybody? Oh, we had to fight and protect ourselves so much, and then with great reluctance we say, yeah, I think I was wrong. What conceit! If you're little in your own eyes, you'd have no problem. Or you've heard me say the wrong way to apologize to your wife or to anybody else. If I have hurt you, please forgive me. You know the meaning of that? I don't think I've hurt you. But if you're stupid enough to think I've hurt you, okay, I'm sorry. If ever you use the word if in your apology, that's what you're saying. If you are stupid enough to think I made a mistake, okay, I'm sorry. But most believers I have met in my life apologize like that. Okay, if you think that was wrong, I'm sorry. It's not an apology. It's conceit because you're so big in your own eyes. And you want to remain big in the eyes of others. How much you have missed, my brothers and sisters, through all these years when your life could have been like, a, like rivers of living water flowing from your life to bless thousands of people Trickles are coming out just because of one thing. You won't allow God to break your pride, your opinion about yourself. You keep justifying yourself. You will not apologize. You get offended. Die to all that, my brother, sister. Die. Let God break you. Let that corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. Then you will see Jesus. 
you'll see how he allowed himself to be broken, to be called all types of names and he never defended himself. This is the savior we say we are following. This is the one we say we want to be disciples of. May God help us to mean what we say. Let's pray. I don't think we can ever get light on ourselves unless God gives it to us. You can intellectually understand a message and you'll forget it very soon. What you need to do is to ask God to blind you with his light so, so strongly that you'll never be the same again. You know that song we sing, I'll never be the same again? That's what you need to pray. Lord, I want you to do such a thorough work in me that I shall remain little in my own eyes with my face in the dust till the end of my life on earth Thank you for these great examples I see in scripture of what you could do even with a man like Peter. Lord, I want to follow in the footsteps of such godly men. Work in my life. You young brothers and sisters, start. Let God didn't do that work early in your life. God's got great plans for you young people. But he'll never be able to commit spiritual authority to you Believe me, if you don't allow God to break you in your younger days and keep you small in your own eyes, you sisters, God can accomplish a lot through you if you allow God to break you and make you small in your own eyes. Start when you're young. Heavenly Father, please help us. Give us grace. Give me grace. Give us all grace to keep our face in the dust, to be little in our own eyes till the end of our life on earth, so that we can decrease and you can increase in all of our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.